thy knife chip and shatter. May thy knife chip and shatter. Welcome back, everyone. It's Charlie. This will be my full breakdown of Doom Part 2. Hopefully you have a chance to see the movie. We'll cover some of the biggest changes from the original book. And I'll also talk about the ending, the teasers for Part 3, Dune Messiah, and all the things the director or the cast have said about the future of the story beyond this. So if you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. Remember, they're also doing the Dune TV show on HBO later this year. We'll probably get a trailer for that after House of the Dragon comes out. Careful for spoilers if you haven't seen Dune Part 2 yet because we'll be talking about the entire movie start to finish, but the movie adapts the second half of the first book, just called Dune. If you watch the original David Lynch Dune movie, that movie tried to do the entire first book in the single movie and wound up cutting way more of the story. This new movie also makes some big changes of its own for pacing reasons and because it's part of a planned trilogy, some of the changes they made were to specifically set up things they'll pay off during Part 3, like Aaliyah, for instance. And if you haven't seen the sci-fi Dune miniseries from the early 2000s, it's actually the closest adaptation of the original books. They also wound up adapting Dune Messiah and Children of Dune, the next books after this, pretty accurately. So I'm kind of expecting the same thing with the Dune Messiah movie. Like, it'll also be a little more different from the books than the original sci-fi miniseries part of that story. We will see what happens by the time they get to God Emperor of Dune. That is going to be super weird and super trippy, but if these movies keep making money, they will definitely turn that into a movie eventually. Just starting at the beginning of the movie, they open the same way they did with the first movie with the Sardaukar throat chanting. This time they say, power over spice is power over all, and the message is meant to convey the entire theme of the movie. Because the whole movie is about Paul gaining control of Spice on Arrakis in order to gain control over the Emperor and the Empire itself. Because in the Dune universe, virtually all people need the Spacing Guild to travel between planets and the Spacing Guild navigators that pilot their massive ships can't function without the Spice. So that's why during the Dune series, everybody keeps saying the Spice must flow because the universe would grind to a halt without it. There are beings and cultures in the Dune universe that try to come up with workarounds for this dependence on spice, but that's either extremely rare and in other cases doesn't really happen until thousands of years later in the plot from where we are now. So for right now in the timeline, everybody, everybody must have their spice. It is going to be the most precious resource in the universe for a good long while. And right now, Paul controls all of it under threat of his nuclear weapons, which are referred to as atomics. I'll explain the mythology of atomics in the Dune universe later in the video because they're meant to be relics, like old weapons from an ancient war that all got banned across the universe long ago. So the fact that the Atreides family kept their stockpile rather than destroy them is a huge, huge deal. The beginning of the movie covers Paul and Lady Jessica's early days with the Fremen right after the end of the last movie. Like, barely any time has gone by, so the idea is the end of the first movie, he has the fight with Jameis, he wins, then they begin traveling to that northern siege that Stilgar takes them to later at the beginning of the film. And at the beginning of Dune Part 2, they're still on the way to that siege, like they just stop off because of the Harkonnens. When Chani compliments Paul for killing the Harkonnen troop, she says he fought well after he woke up. That's a reference to the book line, The Sleeper Must Awaken. Father, the sleeper has awakened! Which also plays into the whole idea of Paul drinking the waters of life and fully coming into his powers as the Quitsat Satirak. When he says he can finally see clearly forwards and backwards in time. It means his visions are much clearer, so he can see the past, everything that has ever happened in the future, although technically he's got the ability to see all possible futures. It's a little bit like Loki or Doctor Strange with the Time Stone during Avengers Infinity War, where he can see all possible futures based on actions that anybody might take in present day. That's why at the end of the movie, he says that after he's taken the water of life, he can see a narrow way through where they survive this, because in all other timelines, they always die. Kind of like Doctor Strange's 1 in 14 million chance, like there's one way in 14 million we take these actions that we survive all this. But before he takes the waters of life, he has limited ability to predict the future, but his visions aren't always as clear. That's part of how he's able to win more Fremen believers early on. He keeps having victory over victory against the Harkonnen spice miners because he's using his visions to predict where they're going to be, how they're going to fight, so he can defeat them much faster. 
They also open the movie with narration from Princess Irulan. During the movie, she tries to discover what really happened to the Atreides on Arrakis and why the Harkonnens attacked them because her father, the Emperor, played by Christopher Walken, has told her nothing of his secret plans. She refers to them as his calculus of power. And when she says the Emperor thought of Duke Leto Atreides as a son, like he was very close to him, she's honest about that, like they were very close. So even though he essentially ordered the end of his family, he feels extremely, extremely bad about it. But pretty early on, she discovers the truth of the matter that the Emperor ordered the hit himself on the Atreides and helped the Harkonnens to do it in order to prevent Leto Atreides from gaining too much power inside the Landstrad, the universal government made up of all the ruling houses. She also learns that it was really, like dot dot dot, really the Bene Gesserit behind everything. Reverend Mother Mohayim essentially admits that she planted the idea to get rid of Leto Atreides in the Emperor's head, so really it was Reverend Mother Mohayim that was behind the fall of the Atreides. She claims that it was because she wanted to protect their Kwisatz Haderach breeding program. They had multiple bloodlines running through different great houses, and Leto Atreides and Paul were too defiant. Like, I see defiance in your eyes, just like the father. And she was worried should their bloodline continue and a Kwisatz Haderach manifest from their bloodline, the Bene Gesserit would not be able to control them. And that was the whole idea, is they wanted to produce a Kwisatz Haderach that they had complete control over. Turns out she was right to be afraid because it happened and they cannot control Paul. And if it wasn't clear, the princess is also a Bene Gesserit. She was trained in the Bene Gesserit order. She is loyal to them over her loyalty to her father, the emperor. Which is why Mohayim has such an easy time preventing her from telling her father that Paul is still alive on Arrakis before he gets Paul's challenge at the end of the movie because the princess figured it out way before that. So for the second half of the movie, the princess is preparing for the eventuality that either Paul or Fade will prevail on Arrakis and she'll have to marry the winner in order to secure peace. So no matter what, she's going to have to get married to one of them. That's why by the time Paul wins at the end of the movie and suggests the marriage to her as a condition of peace, she knew that it would happen and had prepared for it and used it to her advantage to spare her father's life because that was one of her conditions like, you have to let my father live. It's also why she didn't look very surprised at his suggestion like, oh, you want to get married? Okay, yeah, we can do that. While Paul and Jessica are acclimating to life with the Fremen, Baron Harkonnen has retaken control of spice mining on Arrakis and names Raban governor again with a chain of leadership. His long-term plan is to eventually blackmail the Emperor into a marriage with Fade so that House Harkonnen would become the ruling house of the Empire. All under threat of another civil war, if the Emperor would have turned him down, he would have just revealed the Emperor's secret plan to destroy House Atreides to the Landstraud, and per the laws of their empire, the Emperor isn't allowed to show favoritism like that or participate in battles between great houses. So all the great houses of the Landstraud theoretically would have banded together to destroy the Emperor's house, basically eliminating him, so the Emperor was always going to have to agree to a marriage alliance like this with one of the great houses no matter what. Earlier in the movie, the planet that you keep seeing the princess and the emperor on where everyone's meeting is Kaitan. It's the second throne world of the empire. Their ancestral home is Seleucus Secundus, which is where the Sardaukar were training during the first movie. But due to its harsh environment, one of the emperor's ancestors moved the throne world to Kaitan. You know, much nicer world. Maybe when we get to the next movie, we'll start visiting other planets. Like they're slowly introducing other planets in the mythology. Probably one of the biggest changes that they made to the original book is the way they adapted the Aaliyah character, Paul's younger sister, who was played by Anya Taylor-Joy. During the book, they don't really talk to her while she's still in the womb, and she doesn't really speak to them from inside the womb or to Paul before she's born. During the book, she's also born and is eventually the one to kill the Baron Harkonnen instead of Paul doing it at the end of the movie. But obviously the reason why they had Paul do it at the end of the movie is because they chose not to have Aaliyah born until Dune Messiah. So as part of some of these changes, they keep showing you visions of her as a fetus. Like they open the movie with a shot of her as a fetus and Paul talking to her. But if it wasn't clear on the timeline here, Lady Jessica doesn't actually start hearing her voice, Anya Taylor-Joy's voice as Aaliyah, talking back and forth with her until she takes the water of life. Before that moment, Aaliyah is just a totally normal baby like any other. When she takes the water of life, it not only opens up her consciousness, it also causes Aaliyah, as a fetus, to become totally conscious and gain the full powers of a reverend mother. So essentially, you have this tiny little fetus growing inside her, this exactly the same power level as this really, really powerful reverend mother. 
So that's why after she's taken the waters of life and Aaliyah starts talking through Jessica to Paul, like your sister's asking you about this. She says that you're lying. She always knows when you're lying. They try to frame things in a way that make it feel like Aaliyah is an adult character, even though technically she's still an undeveloped fetus. There are a couple moments too, like especially during this moment when Aaliyah speaks with her voice, like Anya Taylor-Joy's voice through Jessica's mouth saying that both of them will be waiting for Paul in the South. It's super cool and super creepy. Later in the movie, she also talks to Paul through his visions, and you see an adult version of her. That's what she'll look like during Dune Messiah. Without getting too far ahead of the plot, she is going to rip so hard when we get to the next couple of movies. There are a couple Easter eggs here earlier in the movie, too. When Jessica admonishes Paul for turning his back on the Harkonnen while he's in the middle of a fight, that's a reference to Gurney in the first movie yelling at Paul, saying the same thing, never turn your back on an enemy. At the siege, they start showing the progression of Paul's status with the Fremen community. Some believe the Bene Gesserit propaganda that he's their messiah, the Lisa and all Gaib, mostly the more religious southerners who Chinese says are fundamentalists, like Stilgar. Stilgar is like the number one Paul stand through the entire movie. Anything that he does or Jessica does happens because of the prophecy, according to him, which Chani is correct about, is propaganda planted there centuries ago by the Bene Gesserit. All the Northerners tend to be more skeptical of him at first, including Chani, who is from the North. One of the other changes the movie makes from the books is the way they portray the prophecy and the way Paul comes into this very aware that he is taking advantage of the Fremen's belief in order to get revenge on the Emperor. That's all he cares about at first. Like, he cares about his revenge and he'll do whatever it takes to get it. Eventually, he starts to care about Chani. He does want to help the people. He's not trying to take advantage of them, which is why he keeps refusing to go south where millions of Fremen already worship him and tries to avoid taking the water of life as long as possible. All because his visions of the future, or nightmares as he calls them, are him seeing his mother leading him to a future where he gets a bunch of people killed. And all those visions are the holy war that begins at the end of the movie. And he winds up ultimately, I think, getting somewhere north of like 60 billion people across the universe killed. Really high, really high body count there. Eventually what starts to happen though is that Jessica and Aaliyah also begin to believe more in the actual prophecy. At the beginning, Jessica is very clear about exploiting the prophecy just to help Paul and their family survive. Like, we'll do whatever it takes to help Paul survive. They almost make her seem kind of sinister the way she talks about going after the weaker Fremen first. Like, we'll go after the ones who are afraid of us. But eventually at the end of the movie, even though she knows the prophecy was a Bene Gesserit plant, so does Aaliyah, they start to believe that it's all real. Early on, Stilgar also convinces Jessica to replace their dying Reverend Mother and shows her their secret stashes of water hidden all over the planet. When he says they're prophesied to turn Arrakis into a green paradise again, that's stuff that they won't fully pay off until God Emperor of Dune, which is like three movies away at this point. But it's also a reference to that line at the end of the movie where Paul says, lead them to paradise and begin the holy war essentially. There are a lot of little references in this movie, in the previous movie, to things that won't fully get paid off until a couple movies down the line if they keep going, which they probably will. When Jessica says she can sense so many souls coming from the water, that's the dead souls she's sensing because the water is taken from the Fremen's dead over many centuries. So they're like hundreds of thousands of people making up this one single body of water, and there are thousands of these all over the planet, basically every Fremen who has ever lived. When Lady Jessica takes the water of life, and they joke calling it worm piss, the water of life is actually the bile of young sandworms. Later in the movie, they show Jessica and Aaliyah how they extract it from the young worms. And basically the process of her taking the water of life is like you saw in previous movies like it is in the books. Essentially them realizing that she's pregnant and they potentially created the abomination in Aaliyah. The whole idea is they've given someone this great power who might not be able to control it and might be corrupted by the different memories that they have access to now. We can't really talk about Aaliyah becoming the abomination because that kind of gets into the plot of Dune Messiah and Children of Dune. She becomes like a really, really big character in the story and that whole abomination storyline is the biggest part of it. Less to say the Reverend Mother here is right to be afraid of what they just did. Like, what have we done? It is not going to end well. Normally, the water of life would be fatal to any male who drank it. Paul's only able to survive because of his Quitsat Sadrach powers, and with a little help from Chani's tears, the whole desert spring part of the prophecy from which her secret name comes. The reason why she says she hates her secret name is because she hates the prophecy itself and thinks it's only a Bene Gesserit tool used to enslave the Fremen in the prophecy about the tears. Her name basically just reminds her of that. 
they start to show Paul and Chani's developing relationship. Several months go by during the movie, so by the end of the film, they've been a bonded couple for a good long while. One of the other big changes in the movie is that they also make Lady Jessica Aaliyah Chani storylines all much bigger than they were in previous retellings of the story. This is why you spend so much more time with Chani and see more of her interacting with other characters who are not Paul. More of her being engaged in the day-to-day -day actual fighting. This is also to develop the big twist at the end with the marriage and so that it hits way harder and feels like a much bigger betrayal to her because she wasn't expecting it even though Irulan was. Pa becoming a Fadaikin is also from the books. That's part of their warrior class, essentially the ones who go on missions like this all the time, and Stilgar giving him his names and him selecting his other name, Usul, which means the base of the pillar, and Ma'adi, which is basically that small desert mouse that they kept showing you in the first movie and in the second movie. One of the other sly reasons why he selects this other secret name of the small mouse is because Ma Deeb sounds a lot like Ma Di, which is where the prophecy comes from, and he's trying to get more of these Fremen from the north to believe in him. So them thinking about his name Ma Deeb makes them think more about Ma Di, and there's this sly way of slowly turning them to his cause just a little bit faster. Writing the grandfather worm for the first time is also from the books. Huge moment. Sandworms also live for thousands of years, so you have to remember the fact he calls a grandfather worm means it's extremely old. And it's really once news of him calling the grandfather worm going around, pretty much all the Fremen everywhere on the planet start worshipping him as their messiah, and he starts to become very uncomfortable with his plan, taking advantage of them. A lot of people have thought of the Dune storyline as a metaphor of the white savior trope and the cautionary tale about what can happen. This movie at least tries to portray him as being a little more aware of that, like he doesn't want to be the white savior coming in trying to rescue everyone, even though it does kind of wind up ending up that way. Ultimately, he winds up having to lead them to all this bloodshed and death that he was trying to avoid the whole time. This is also a reference to the Golden Path from the books, which is the whole reason why the Bene Gesserit created their centuries-old breeding program to create the Kwisat Satarak in the first place, of being powerful enough to lead humanity along the golden path, which is basically the best possible timeline. So they needed to being powerful enough to be able to spot what the best timeline was. And one of the biggest problems is that getting there requires a ton, a ton of bloodshed. This is why Paul is so hesitant to begin the steps on that journey, taking the water of life, going to the south. Then after Irulan figures out the truth of everything Mohayim did, that Paul is still alive, and that everything is going on, they introduce the new Austin Butler version of Fade. He's meant to be the Baron's successor. That's why everybody refers to him as Na Baron, the next Baron, basically. This is also why the Baron tells him that he's going to make him the next Emperor when revealing his marriage plot. They also reveal Fade is one of the other Bene Gesserit bloodlines in their Kwisatz Satarak program. That's why Lady Margot Fenrig forces him to sire an heir with her so his Kwisatz Satarak bloodline can continue if he's killed by Paul, which he is. So there is a Fade daughter out there after the end of the movie. Don't worry, that baby will become important in future movies. You could do a bunch of videos just about Fade and his brother Raban's backstory. They have such a crazy history. They briefly touch on that during the movie, like very quickly, like they reference Fade killing his mother, which is why Mohayim didn't test him herself with the box in the Gamjabar, because she had a motherly presence, as she joked, and he basically killed his mother. They don't really get into too much of the history behind the Baron, too much in the books, but the idea is the Baron himself selected Fade as his heir, who was basically his nephew, because the Baron himself had no sons, no wife, because essentially he's gay. But one of the other big reveals of the movie is that Lady Jessica was really his daughter sired by one of the other Bene Gesserit. Basically the same situation that Lady Margot has with Fade, forcing him to sire an heir, which was a female. Jessica is also telling the truth to Paul when she says she didn't know that she was the Baron's daughter until she took the Water of Life and gained access to all these previous memories, being able to see the entire past. So when Paul is joking with Fade at the end of the movie about them being cousins, that is correct. They are biologically cousins. And even though they try to make Fade look a little more book accurate during this movie, like the black teeth and the no hair, when the Baron was younger, he looked just like Fade, like he was much more handsome. In the present day, the reason why he's become so bloated, messed up with diseases, is because Reverend Mother Mohayim tried to sire that heir with him when they were younger, and the Baron abused her, almost killed her. Her revenge was to come back, drug him, forced him to sire Lady Jessica, that's where she came from, then injected the Baron with a bunch of genetic diseases, slowly destroying his body, turning it into the mess that you see here. 
During Fade's birthday battle with the surviving Atreides troops and the doctor, they show he's a good fighter, but most of the time during his battles, they imply that they drug his opponents, so essentially all of his fights are fixed. And if it wasn't totally clear, when Margot is tricking Fade into siring the air with her, she also implants a Bene Gesserit trigger word in his mind that when uttered will cause total body paralysis, and the whole idea is that Mohayim wants to be able to control the Kwisat Satarek program, all the different bloodlines. And because Fade is total crazy town banana pants, she just wants his genes, like she wants the bloodline to continue, they'll just use trigger words, sexuality, humiliation, all kinds of things to control him while he's still alive as long as they need to. Then we finally see Gurney come back into the story. He survived. Playing the song is also meant to be a callback to the deleted scenes from the first movie. Josh Brolin created some music to play during the first film, but they wind up cutting it for time. Speaking of deleted scenes, there were a couple characters that they brought back in Dune Part 2 that got cut for time. They brought back Thufir. They didn't say what he was doing in his scenes, but they also had Tim Blake Nelson playing a version of Lady Margot's husband. He's a mentat. They got a special thanks credit at the end of the movie, so no idea what they were actually doing in the scenes that they filmed. Gurney introduces the Atreides' secret stockpile of atomics. These are a huge deal. They come from the Butlerian Jihad era centuries ago when humanity fought a giant war against the thinking machines, basically artificial intelligence. This is why all the technology in the Dune universe in present day seems so advanced yet so old-timey at the same time, because all artificial intelligence was banned after humanity destroyed the last thinking machines. Shortly after the Butlerian Jihad, the survivors amongst the great houses across the universe held a great convention outlawing the further use of nuclear weapons, atomics as they called them, and everybody was ordered to destroy their stockpiles. But as Gurney says here, House Atreides never did. Probably some of the other great houses also still have some of their atomics too. And each subsequent duke inside the House Atreides line until now just kept them in secret storage wherever their family was located. In present day, Paul intends to use them as a threat to the Landstraw, the other great houses in the Emperor, that he'll destroy all spice on the planet, bringing the entire universe to a standstill. Here's the thing about atomics. The treaty banning nuclear weapons essentially said that violators would have their entire planet wiped from existence, like nuked from orbit by the other great houses if they were found using them. The whole reason why Paul was able to get around this rule is because not only are they on Arrakis and they didn't want to destroy Arrakis because that would mean destroying all spice, but also the way Paul used his atomics, just destroying the shield wall. So he narrowly avoided pissing off all the other great houses before he named himself the new emperor, like before his ascension. He wound up pissing them all off anyway for completely different reasons. Then I already explained how they changed the first big part of the ending here with Paul being the one to kill the Baron instead of Aaliyah. Them also planting him outside with the ants crawling all over his body too was a bit of a change. Paul defeats Fade during their knife fight. It was some great fight choreography right out of the books. And even though they generally captured the themes of the book in the ending here, they cut a big moment of Chani and Irulan talking about how history would call them wives. The movie version of the ending makes Chani feel way more betrayed, way more pissed off at Paul's decision to marry the princess. She leaves on the sandworm as Paul commands all the Fremen to take the Emperor's ships and lead them to paradise, like begin the holy war, the Jihad, that will basically play out over the events of Doom Messiah. But remember, the holy war is meant to cover the entire universe, not just what's happening around Arrakis. One of the other big changes is that all the great houses have brought their warships to orbit. The Baron lured them here by informing them of the Emperor's presence, claiming that the Harkonnens were under attack by the Emperor. Like, why would the Emperor bring his entire army to Arrakis? But the reason why Paul started the war was because after he got the Emperor to agree to his terms, the great houses refused to accept his ascension to become the new Emperor. If you remember during the events of the first movie, he has visions of the actual jihad going down, like billions and billions of people being killed in his name. Like I said, over 60 billion people. RIP, and now it's coming to pass. One of the other reasons why they probably wanted the Great House's warships in orbit here is so that when Dune Part 3, Dune Messiah begins, you can start that movie with a giant space battle. You had to imagine like the beginning of Star Wars Revenge of the Sith, like the crazy space battle happening in orbit. Overall, most of all these changes from the books were meant to service setting up moments in Dune 3 or character arcs that'll play out over the next couple of movies. One of the other biggest changes, too, is there's no actual flash forward. Like, you don't actually see Leto II or Ganema as children, Chinese children with Paul. 
The idea of his marriage to Irulan, the princess, is that it's in name only. They literally never touch each other. That was Paul's promise to Chani in the book, that he would never touch her, and he never does. This will become a bigger thing in later movies too. Despite accepting the marriage, the princess also continues to be loyal to Reverend Mother Mohayim in the Bene Gesserit order who want to prevent Paul from having any children at any cost. Really big subplot during the next movie, Doom Messiah. So if you thought there wasn't enough princess in this movie, she becomes a much bigger character in the story in the next two movies. And probably one of the other biggest things that the director has talked about is that Dune Part 3, Dune Messiah, will basically be the end of Paul's story. Not necessarily his complete end, like, I mean, they could technically end it in the next movie. He does continue a little bit into the story of Children of Dune, which is like the fourth movie. But I think they're planning on Doom Part 3 to be the end of his time as a main character in the story because essentially his children and some of the other side characters take over the plot heading forward after that. Especially, especially an adult version of Aaliyah who will be played by Anya Taylor-Joy, obviously. I cannot wait to see her go completely crazy. Not getting too far into that, like if you have read ahead in the books, please don't post spoilers for her in the comments. Now everybody's going to be wondering, are they actually going to try and do God Emperor of Dune in the movies? That is going to be so weird. I believe the director, Denis Villeneuve, said that Dune Part 3 is the last movie he's planning on doing himself. They might hand it over to another director for Children of Dune, and it sounds like they will continue with the movies after that. As long as they keep making money, they'll keep making movies. But the other big thing that's happening later this year, like I said, is the Dune TV series coming to HBO. We haven't seen a trailer for that yet. Maybe when House of the Dragon Season 2 starts airing episodes, then they'll start teasing it. There are like a billion other things that you could talk about from this movie. So are there any big Easter eggs or references that I didn't get into in this video that you wanted to talk about, just write them below in the comments. Overall, I thought it was a great movie. I think it's a little more action packed than the first movie for people that thought the first one was a little too slow. I've already posted a review, so I'll post a link for that down in the description below. Next big movie coming up will be Godzilla and Kong. Click here for that big trailer video and click here for all my Deadpool and Wolverine videos. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you guys in the next one.